So thank you everybody for being here, being here on time. We really appreciate it. Um, we're really looking forward to this conversation. So um, I'm going to go through a couple of ground rules and um, uh, just kind of general overview before we get started. But we do have a, a pretty full conversation, so um, I won't take up too much time with that. I just want to um, kind of remind everybody, if you're a Welcome Baby RN, if you could please put your name and your site in the chat, that is how we're taking attendance. Um, and this is a requirement for you, so we want to make sure that you get uh, marked down as, as being here. Uh, the other thing I want to mention is everybody is muted, so um, we, if you have a question at any point for our speaker or for me, please go ahead and put that in the chat box, um, and then I will bring it up to uh, Dr. Hanish when we when we uh, did the Q&A portion of the webinar. So um, we won't be able to hear you if you need to message me, though you can private message me. Uh, if you are on your phone, please don't put us on hold. We do, um, we shouldn't because everybody's muted, but sometimes we do hear your like hold music if you do that. So um, please just mute instead of putting on hold. And then the last thing I wanna mention is that uh, when the webinar is done, I'm gonna send out these slides um, and the notes that uh, we're taking, just general overview of what we talked about. So I'll send that to everybody along with uh, an evaluation link. So please be on the lookout for that uh, when the webinar is over and I'll send that at some point later today. Um, so we have a lot to cover. So without um, further ado, I'm gonna introduce our speaker and then I'll pass it over to her to get started. So. Um, Dr. Kylie Hanish is a speaker, nonprofit founder, entrepreneur, and coach dedicated to helping people through transformational growth and healing after loss. After suffering the stillbirth and loss of her first child, Norbert, Kylie co-created the Emmy-nominated film Return to Zero to break the silence and stigma around pregnancy and infant loss for parents around the world. The film's success and critical acclaim led her to, non to her nonprofit organization, Return to Hope, Return to Zero, Hope, where she advocates for and guides bereaved families in reclaiming their purpose, meaning, and healing after their tragic loss. As an occupational therapist and a speaker, she is widely recognized as a thought leader at the intersection of mental health and the perinatal period. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Kylie Hanish as she presents this webinar, Supporting Parents Through Perinatal Loss and Pregnancy After Loss. Welcome, Kylie. I'm going to find you on my list here and unmute you. There we go. The floor is all yours. Perfect. Thank you, Martha. Um, and thank you everyone for being here, um, for taking time out to learn more about this important topic. Um, and I know also, I just wanna acknowledge that it's a crazy time in the world right now and things are hard and things are chaotic. And so I'm just kind of, honoring and acknowledging that because I know that life is hard right now for all of us. So hopefully we can just be present through this time. And um, and my hope is also that you learn a little bit about n not just baby loss, right? But I think what we learned today can be just taken into your life and applied to various situations with people going through hard things. So. Um, let me just see what there. Okay, my clicker was not working. Um, so as Martha said, my son Norbert was stillborn in 2005. He had a liver cyst that burst um, late into the pregnancy, at w which we didn't know about at the time. Um, I went into labor. Um, it was 35 weeks. I thought I was just having a baby early, and it turned out that his heart had stopped beating. And really, my experience with my doctor, um, with my midwife in the hospital, was as traumatic as losing my son. And it, it was it was really hard for me to understand that that they were not prepared in how to support parents going through a loss because it wasn't like I was the first one going through this and I wasn't going to be the last one. And so really 
you know, I have this deep desire um, not only to help support parents through through the loss of their baby, but also to help train providers give and you know give them information and knowledge to empower them and to create confidence as they work with women in the perinatal period. And so that's kind of a little you know a little bit about my story and why I'm here. And um with with Return to Zero that I'm just trying to think that came out in 2014 and just um you can watch it just trying to think it used to be on netflix it's on itunes and amazon prime at the moment and i believe on starting on november 1st it's going to be available for free on pluto tv um so you can watch it there but it's a so it's a feature film based on our story and it just gives you an intimate look at how loss affects a couple how it affects their community of family and friends um looks at the mental health struggles after a loss. And so if you haven't watched it, I really encourage you to watch it to just to get like an insider's view of what it's like to go through this. And then um, I, I started in 2014 doing weekend retreats for moms who had been through a loss and they were, you know, I'm an occupational therapist, so it very much focused on the holistic view of healing and healing as something that you actively participate in. And um, we've been doing those. And then in 2018, we transitioned into a nonprofit organization, Return to Zero Hope. So um, that's kind of a little bit about me and where I'm coming from. And so we're gonna start by looking at types of pregnancy and infant loss and some statistics around that, right? It's it's common. So if we're looking at miscarriage, they're saying one in four women will have a miscarriage. Um, the numbers actually can, some believe can be as high as 50% because there's a lot of miscarriages that are undetected, that um, may, they're maybe not reported, but it is very common but still people are not talking about it. And then um, these numbers are for the US. So in the US each year, 24,000 babies are stillborn and 23,000 die within the first month of their life. And then just looking a little bit closer at, you know, what, what might fall into these categories. So if for miscarriage, miscarriage is technically defined in the United States as a loss of a pregnancy before 20 weeks gestation. It might also include a molar pregnancy, a blighted ovum, an ectopic pregnancy. Um, and then I include here terminations for medical reasons and termination for non-medical non reasons are types of pregnancy loss. Um, and then stillbirth is defined as a loss at 20 weeks or later gestation. Um, a neonatal death is within the first 28 days of life, and then an infant death is in the first year of life. And I also want to acknowledge the disparities within pregnancy and infant loss. So, Within the African American community, stillbirth rates of Black mothers compared to all other races combined are twice as likely. And then preterm births in Black moms are 2.3 times as likely as Caucasian moms. And the most prevalent cause of death for Black babies is a premature birth. So the statistics are you know there's a great disparity within the statistics and looking at why this is happening and i know that there's been more focus on um maternal mortality lately we've been seeing more about that in the news and social media um and just looking at like also it's it's impacting infant mortality so it's maternal and infant mortality and why is this happening so looking at 
the concept of weathering, that social environmental factors cause chronic stress in black moms. And this leads to a deterioration of health as a black woman um, as they navigate you know, their, their healthcare system, coming in contact with systemic racism, implicit bias. Um, and so I'm just, I'm not gonna talk too much about this, but I'm just bringing it to your attention. So these high rates of losses within the African-American community can be due to the chronic stress experienced by black women. Um, and also acknowledging that a lot of times black mothers aren't often taken seriously for their pain. They're, they're thought to have a higher pain tolerance and maybe they aren't treated for their pain. So I'm just bringing this in into your orbit. Um, at the end of the presentation, there's a link. So a link in the notes so that at on our website, we have a page devoting to grieving in the black community. There are three webinars on there that are free that you can watch and learn more about, um, you know, the, the high rates of loss and then grieving in the black community. And so I encourage you to take a look at that if you want to learn more. And there's also like a reference list there that you can read more. There's, there's a lot of really great information. Um, so I'm going to move into now this next section is if you are with your patient when they learn that their babies died before they've had a loss and and things that you can share with them or ways to empower them so that they can make this in this very sad, tragic time, the best that it can be. Um, because I, I do believe that if parents are educated and the experience is normalized um, and they're <clears throat> explained procedures to ahead of time, right? Like taking out the fear, reducing the trauma, it can really reduce mental health implications in the future. So I'm going to first talk about preparing parents. So if they have to have a procedure, um, what can we tell them about that? Whether it's a DNC, it could be a labor induction, um, things like that. What can they expect? What's going to happen in the procedure? What decisions can they make ahead of time? Can they create a birth plan or wishes? Right, like their birth plan is not going to be what they thought it was going to be, but what do they want this experience to look like? And begin to introduce the concept of parenting the baby. So if, let's say they have a stillbirth or they give birth and they know that their baby's going to die. Um, this idea of like, this is the only time the parents will have with their baby. And how do we, how do we take that time and, you know, normalize it as like, this is your baby. You should, you, you know, you should and can um, use this time to really, to make memories with your baby. And so I think it's, it's normalizing the experience for them it's we're doing this to reduce future regrets in addition to reducing mental health trauma we want to encourage the family to spend as much time as they need with their child you know that it's it's not like oh their baby's born and the baby has to be taken away right away that that they do have the opportunity to spend time um, maybe they want to in terms of memory making like naming the baby. Um, have, can they have skin to skin contact with the baby? Can they bathe the baby and dress the baby? Can they rock the baby, hold, cuddle, sing? Um, maybe they want to read a book to the baby. And then taking photographs. And although that sounds very strange, 
I know that it sounded strange to me that oftentimes we're in a state of shock after we've been through a labor and delivery. Um, and taking photos, it's like, it's the only thing that we will have going forward. And, and even if the parents don't want to look at the photos, it's a, it's a good thing for them to have that just in case later they want to look at them. You know, it helps them, is, especially later on, to know that their baby was real, that their baby existed. And um, there's a, a nonprofit out there called Now I Lay Me Down to Sleep. And I know in LA, they, I haven't heard of great success in finding photographers, but they they do have volunteer photographers that will come out and take just really beautiful, like newborn-esque photos of the baby and they'll do touch-ups. But if you can't get them, sometimes a hospital will have another newborn photographer that they work with that they can call to come out. Um, and a lot of stuff can be done in like um, in Photoshop to do editing of the photos to just take away some of the, maybe the skin is like that layer of the skin is peeling or just, you know, make things black and white. It's just so it makes it looks beautiful and that we're not looking at the picture reminded of the trauma. So that is available. Um, and then another thing to just be aware of is ask the parents if they would like to request a religious service or ceremony in the hospital. So maybe this is with the hospital chaplain, or it could be with their own faith leader coming into the hospital. Uh, I know with COVID that might not be possible, but maybe it's a blessing or a baptism, something like that. So it's really, I would say, you know, what I would say to remember is treating the baby as if it were a live baby. And, you know, treating the baby with the utmost respect. And that's what we can hope from um, within the hospital. But, but from your end, it's like when you're encouraging them uh, as you're preparing them is is it isn't treating the baby like, oh, the baby's not alive. And so therefore it, it's not worth anything. It doesn't mean anything. It's like the opposite as the baby is their baby. It's their child. And we just, we need to encourage them to do things that they would do with their baby as if it were alive. So I know it sounds a little strange, but just tr trust me on this. Um, and I would say some parents will be free and again, it would just be like, your job is to normalize it for them. Normalize, um, repeat yourself, you know, if you happen to be there, just offering, because they might change their mind. And once the baby comes, it might, you know, it is their baby and they love their baby and they may change their mind. So just those are things to keep in mind. Um, I did want to say that on our website, which is if you look at them, the menu bar at the top is called at the hospital. This is a guide that we created for parents, um, but also for health providers who are working with parents of what has been helpful to other parents in the situation where their baby about the
often will blame themselves. Um, try not to judge them. Try not to offer advice. And don't compare losses. Um, you know, if you yourself have been through a loss, I think that you can use your intuition to whether or not that this um, would be a good thing to share. Sometimes it is because, because the, the mom could feel like, you know, am I the first person that this has happened to? And to know that they're not alone, right? Because it, it's such an isolating experience. But these are just things that a lot of people say and that even though, right, they're coming from a good place, they're, they are hurtful. And then looking at what to say, you know, and just, I want to remind you that every word and every action will have a large impact on the parents. And that puts a lot of pressure on you. And I don't wanna scare you, but it does. And so it's important to like, look at this and practice, what are you gonna say? Um, and it is your job as a provider to act as a guide for these parents, that they're in a situation that they never thought they would be in. They're not prepared for it. They're in shock, they're numb, they're freaking out and they need a guide. Um, and so I think that you, you being here and you learning is a tremendous gift that you can give to so many parents in the future that will go through this. Um, and I just wanna also point out here is ask about the baby's name, um, if they name their baby um, and use the baby's name, um, right? Like instead of, like never, I would say, going back to the what not to say, like never say like, this is a fetal demise. Like even though that's medical terms, don't say that, you know, it's say like, call the baby by name and and just again when in doubt treat the baby as if it were a live baby you know say like how beautiful your baby is and i mean even if the baby looks different it's still their baby um and they still are going to love their baby no i mean even if it's scary and all that it's you know it is their baby so just remember that and then I would say here, if the hospital has a possibility of a special, you know, whether it's a special room for the, the parents going through this, that's kind of away from crying babies, that can be helpful. Um, it can also be helpful for the family of, like the extended family of the family who's going through a loss if there's a space for them so they don't have to wait in the happy waiting room with all the other families who are waiting for live babies to be born. Like if it's not, you know, an overly full hospital situation, can you create a space in the hospital for this family that, that they can grieve and be quiet and mournful and sad? Um, and then I'm going to talk just a little bit generally about mental health and perinatal loss. So this is a very complex picture because we have an intersection of three things going on. You know, we have grief, right? Their baby has died. Um, we have trauma. I, it is a trauma if your baby dies inside of you or your baby dies immediately after it's it's traumatic and there could be also other traumatic things about the birthing experience um there's also postpartum whether it's depression anxiety ocd ptsd this is you know this is also happening right because even if they don't have a live baby they've had a baby their hormones are shifting and all that. So if you put all those three things together, it's very complex. And I would say that there's a lot of overlap of symptoms and it isn't necessarily important to know which one of these is causing the symptoms, um, but it's, it's good to know that there's these factors going into it. And I assume with your patient clients that there's a lot of other risk factors 
going into postpartum mood and anxiety disorders um, that you're probably aware of, right? It's like their their social support, their economic situation, their, you know, are they a single parent? Do they, what's their living situation? Do they have other children? Do they have previous trauma? Like all these different things. So it's very complex. And we have more resources and references on our website for you to look more into this. But just saying that bereaved moms have four times a greater chance of having, having depression symptoms and seven times increased odds of having PTSD symptoms than non-bereaved mothers. And so really, you know, if there's a way for someone to follow these moms um, or refer them to somebody that their chances of mental health issues is quite high and they're going to need support after their loss. I mean, everyone needs support after a loss. And so I'm just kind of bringing that to your awareness of it's complicated and they need support. Okay, so I will stop briefly here and see if anyone has any questions about about the kind of what to say, what not to say, and mental health. Hi, Kylie. Um, I apologize that my computer shut down randomly, so oh. um, I'm back. Oh, no. And uh, we do have one question for you. Um, yes. So it is, how would you deal with a mom who shares she doesn't even want to hold the baby or see the baby at all? Well, I would, I mean, it's depending like when she's saying this, I mean, if she's saying this before she has the baby, <clears throat> I would continue to ask afterwards. Um, if she says this after the baby's been born, um, things that can be helpful. I mean, is one to continue to ask, but you can say like, do you want to see her foot? You know, oh my gosh, her foot is so beautiful. Like pick up, pick a specific body part and start with that. Um, and you don't want to force, right? Like she's, tra the mom is traumatized, but it could be like, oh, would you look, look at her beautiful hands and fingers. Like they're, you know, and just kind of talk about a specific part of the body that could be helpful. Um, I would encourage somebody to take photos and someone else to hold the baby if possible. Um, and the photos can be something that even if she's not ready to see that someone has it later, if she does indeed change her mind. And to, to also, if somebody, whether it's you or someone at the hospital, can can do some of these things like um, taking a lock of the baby's hair, taking hand handprints, footprints, um, things like that, so that she can have it later on, right? Because she's she's in shock and she's not in her right frame of mind, and so she's not able to make decisions because she's just not acting out of like a place of calmness. And so that's what that's what I would suggest is some ideas on what what you can do. But it's hard, you know. And if the mom wants to just leave, but those are things that can be done fairly quickly, <clears throat> even if the mom's like I want to get out of the hospital really quickly. You can still do handprints or foot or molds. Um you can take a lock of hair, you can take some photos, stuff like that. Thank you. I think that's a, that's a helpful answer. Um, we, have, we do have one more that came in the chat. Um, how do you respond yeah. to a mom who says her baby died when you're trying to schedule a visit? She breaks down crying and you're caught off guard. So, oh, so you're calling to schedule a visit and the mom says that the baby's died. Correct. Yeah. Um, and so what to do? Um, I would, I mean, I would start by saying, I'm so very sorry for your loss. And then I would go on to ask her about her baby. I mean, depending on when the loss was, 
Um, right. So like if the loss was later, you can say like, did you name your baby and tell me about what happened and tell me about your baby? Because I will say you bringing it up will not freak them out. They're already thinking about it all the time and they're already really upset. So they want to talk about it most of the time. And chances are most people don't want to listen, right? Most people are freaked out and they, they don't know what to say or do and they say the wrong thing. Um, but that's what I would do. And then, and then I would, you know, end by asking like, what kind of support do you need? And, and can you connect them to support? Like, can you connect them to some kind of counseling or do they need a psychiatrist or is there a support group? Like that type of stuff. Great. Thank you so much. Um, there is one more question, but I think you're going to address it in your next portion of the, um, Okay. Webinar, so I'll okay. continue. Okay. And then if not, you can ask it later. That sounds good. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Martha. Okay. So now I'm going to move into a section talking about pregnancy after loss, because I, I think that um, a lot of you may be encountering moms who are pregnant again after a loss and this is not talked about a lot, but it is very, very important. And I think the more that we can learn about it and talk about it, we can better support moms going through this. So pregnancy after loss is, is traumatic or can be traumatic, right? Um, being pregnant again is the biggest reminder that they've had a loss and you know, in their previous pregnancy and loss, that they've they have a loss of innocence, right? They they can't believe anymore that if they become pregnant, they will have a baby. There's a lot of times self blame for their loss. There's, you know, there's the uncertainty that they can keep their child safe. There's a loss of control, like right, like when a loss happens, it we really understand like how little control we have and you you're very scared during this pregnancy it's a time of great anxiety and having a loss is a risk factor for mental health complications in future pregnancies so um and being aware that having a subsequent healthy pregnancy does not resolve mental health problems that women experience after their miscarriage or stillbirth or their infant death. So the new baby is not going to replace the baby that died and it will not make everything better. better. And so within this pregnancy after loss, there is, you know, very complex emotions. So as a provider, what we need to do is we need to normalize what this time looks like. We want to validate pregnancy after loss is difficult. It's a very difficult time. You know, we want to tell them that it's normal for there to be the coexistence of both anxiety and hope, you know, anxiety over being pregnant and hope that they will have a live baby and that grief over their baby that's died and attachment to this new baby have to happen at the same time. So it's complicated. And just knowing, you know, as I said before, the new baby cannot replace the baby who died. It may help lessen some grief reactions, right? But it's not gonna resolve all the grief. Um, and sometimes when the baby is born, the, the live baby, a lot of times, grief that has been had to be kind of put to the side during the pregnancy really just comes in again out of nowhere and it takes you off guard and so like even if the baby comes and it's healthy that some of these complex emotions are going to continue um and there's this this constant wondering and worrying that your baby is healthy and and you know there's no guarantee that you will have a live baby you know 
because you've had a loss. Like you now know that you, you don't know for sure. And then there's, I'm just going to validate and um, say that it is common for moms to have difficulty forming attachment to the new baby. So on one hand, the parents may feel responsible to be sad in order to not forget their baby that died. You know, they think that if I, if I give my attention to this new baby, then I'm going to be abandoning my other baby. Um, and and that's normal. It's not true, but that's the way that you know we think. Um, there's also like a delay or an interruption to the grieving of the pregnancy it, the, to the previous loss. Um, so as I said, when when the baby is born, that there might that the grief might come up again. But in this pregnancy, it's really common to see like a denial of the pregnancy. You know, for myself, I would like wear this really big sweatshirt because I didn't want anyone to know I was pregnant. I didn't want to talk about it. I didn't want people to ask like, oh, is this your first pregnancy? And not wanting to tell them about my loss, not wanting to talk. I just didn't want to talk about it. You know, um, I get the fear of another loss is very much there. The anxiety is very, very high. And then there's a term emotional cushioning. Um, that I recently learned about, and I love it because it gave me language to something that I did and so many of us do when we're pregnant after a loss, is it's a, it's a avoidance of attachment to the baby. Um, and it's very self-protective and it's protecting other people too, right? From hurt that, so the idea is like, if I don't attach to this baby, if I deny my pregnancy, I'm not attaching, I'm holding back my emotions, all that, that if something happens to the baby, if this baby dies, then, then I'm gonna be less hurt or some other people in my life are gonna be less hurt. And this is so not true. We're, of course, we're still gonna be hurt um, and it will be devastating. But this is kind of the thought process that goes behind pregnancy after loss is like, how do we protect ourselves, right? We've been through something horrible and, and we're trying to protect ourselves. Um, so the next thing I wanna talk about is triggering events. So just telling you that most medical, and appo medical appointments and or procedures are going to be triggering. Um, whether it's baby related or not baby related and going, you know, going back to a, the same office, the same hospital is going to be triggering. And so educating the parents about that and, and giving them coping strategies and giving them, I would say, giving them choices on how to make the experience feel safer for them. Do you bring someone else? Like I always would bring someone else with me to every appointment because I didn't want to be alone again when I if I if my baby died and I define it be alone. I was like, I can't deal with this. Like I was just really scared. But for me, going <clears throat> to any doctor put me like still my loss was 15 years ago. My blood pressure goes up when I go to doctor's appointments because I'm just scared of some them telling me something really horrible. Um Okay, baby's birthdays. Um, so when it's the birthday, the due date, the an anniversary of the baby's birthday or death date, those are triggering events. And so just sometimes educating them, like this is gonna be a hard day, a hard week for you. And what can you do to build in some self care around that? Can you lighten your load around those times? Um, maybe we can talk a lot of, I mean, I talk a lot about that, but I'm not going to go too much into detail. Um, baby showers can be very triggering. Um, holidays can be very triggering, right? Like, especially when you have this idea that you were going to be celebrating your first Christmas, your first Thanksgiving, your Halloween, like all these holidays with your baby, and now your baby's not here. And um, a lot of times, 
we just want to hide. Like we don't want to participate in any of that. And I think telling parents that it's okay to opt out of certain holidays and events, it's okay. Like, right, give permission. It's okay. They don't have to. They can give an excuse. Like they can communicate. Like this is just really hard for me. I can't do it right now. Or they can just not give an excuse and either one is fine. Um, but I think to let them know that this is common for these things to be hard in other lost parents, it makes them feel not as strange or crazy. And then just looking a closer look at the trauma of the ultrasound. Um, so as most of you know, I don't know if you know the work of Cheryl Beck, who's a birth trauma researcher, but like she talks about like trauma is in the eye of the beholder. And so really it isn't about what we think is traumatic, it's about what the patient thinks is traumatic. And so, you know, just remembering that it's impossible to repeat the experience of prenatal care without stimulating painful past memories. I mean, can this, this can be for the moms and the dads also. It can be, you know, it isn't just the moms, the dads can be equally as triggered. Um, and especially so if the death was diagnosed by an ultrasound exam, the trauma is like imprinted through all of their senses. They're trying to appear normal for providers, but inside they're a wreck. Um, you know, so again, they're just, they're waiting and fearing the news that their baby has died and they need frequent confirmation that their baby's alive. So is it possible for their provider to allow them to come in and hear the baby's heartbeat or see their baby on the ultrasound machine? Like what can the, what can, what can you all do um, or are there other providers in just providing that reassurance to them during this time of pregnancy after loss? So now the stuff that can be helpful to you is how do you help parents navigate through pregnancy after loss? So I'd first say acknowledge, right? Acknowledge that their loss is affecting their current pregnancy and how could it not? And encourage them to share their feelings with you. Like you may be the only safe place for them to share their feelings and just listening to them and validating, you know, what they're going through. And then normalizing the experience for them. So educating the patients about the mental and the physical challenge of pregnancy after loss, talking about how their previous loss can affect decisions in this current pregnancy, you know, preparing them that past memories may come up. Um, flashbacks are common and just saying like, this is normal and give them language about what they might be feeling, whether it's anxiety, fear, worry, hope, excitement, um, and that they can be feeling all of these feelings at the same time. It isn't either or. And then empowerment. So how can you, how can providers in general pr give parents a sense of control in this experience? Um, do they have unanswered questions related to their previous loss? And what can you do to help them get those answers? Um, and then maybe you're not doing a lot except helping empower them to find things out and give them ideas on who to talk to and what to do. Um, and then it also, in an effort to decrease triggers, you know, I would say in medical appointments, right? Can they ask for what they need? So it'd be maybe you helping them identify what they need, but then it could be the appointment time of day. Like, is there a, is there a better time that they can go into the office so they don't have to see other pregnant women? Can they not have to sit in the waiting room? Can they talk to the front desk staff or the nursing staff and say, when I get in, can you just put me in a room so I don't have to wait out there? Because it's cause, you know, it's just like it's a trigger for me. Can they can they ask to hear the heartbeat first so they know that there's baby a lot their baby's alive before doing anything else? Um, 
So what, what are things? And then just also knowing that stress impairs the ability to remember. So asking the provider, you know, so for them to ask the provider to, to repeat themselves or bring in another person to take notes, especially when there's something wrong, uh, they'll go into a shock a trauma state. And so, and so they need someone else to write things down or audio tape something that, that then they can look at or listen to later. And then I will also say that, you know, for some people, passing the gestational age of their prior loss may help to reassure parents, right? So if they, let's say like I had a loss at 12 weeks or 15 weeks, and if they can get past that certain stage, they they may feel better and be able to become attached to the baby. But in cases where the the loss was later in the pregnancy, like third trimester or you know after birth, the parent is going to have a lot of um, a lot of anxiety throughout the whole pregnancy, and they're not going to really be able to have a moment of like, oh, now I can breathe and relax until until after they know the baby is safe and alive. Let me just a little bit a little bit more about honoring the deceased child um, with this. Like, so they're pregnant again. How do we honor the baby that's not here? Calling the, you know, calling the deceased baby by name, knowing the gestational ages that the baby died, um, the anniversary dates of these previous losses. So like if you're with them and they're gonna go through an anniversary date how can you help just number one normalize that it will be hard for them but also remembering their baby with them and holding space for parents to process their unresolved grief you know encouraging opportunities to create or give meaning to their loss experience you know it's maybe not the loss itself that will have meaning but what we do with that um, whether it it causes us to have stronger faith it could be that we want to help other women going through this it could be that we want to you know the way we live our life is to honor our child things like that um i would also have you encourage them to have a connection to the baby that died and you know that even throughout this pregnancy, that it is a different pregnancy and a different baby and that they can still have that connection. And I would give them permission um, more in the attaching to the new, new baby, giving them permission not to be sad and that they can still be connected to their old, you know, the baby that died through numerous ways. But then as you link the babies, as siblings, right? The deceased baby and the new baby, they're siblings, but they're different. And so they can they can connect to both babies by talking or writing to them. Um, and for the deceased baby, sometimes it's nice to have like, if they have photos of the baby or creating a sacred area in their home. Maybe they want to, they connect through nature or animals or something, some way for them to connect to their baby who's not alive, you know, but also in talking to the deceased baby and saying like, hey, I miss you, I love you, this new baby is not gonna replace you. Um, and just kind of just really being honest about it. But but right, giving giving them permission that it's okay to attach to the new baby and to love this new baby and that doing so is not gonna cut off their connection with their baby who's passed away. So how do we cultivate mental wellness during pregnancy after loss? So I mentioned creating meaning can be helpful. Um, ongoing bonds with a deceased child can be helpful. So I talked about both of those. Ritual can be something that's also um, 
you know, comforting. So this can be, a lot of times we'll use candle lighting as a ritual. Um, it can be candle lighting. It can, and it doesn't have to be a big thing, right? You can just have a little votive candle, light the candle and be like, this is honoring my baby. It can be a very private, personal thing. But, but that is important. Um, social support is important. So that can be from family and friends. Um, sometimes, a lot of times our relationships change after a loss and that going through a pregnancy again after a loss, you know, with all the anxiety, other people really aren't gonna understand us. So our, the friends may shift and change and that's normal, but you know, who can they be honest with and who can they trust? And it need, maybe it's just one person, really. Um, support groups can also be helpful. So support groups with other bereaved parents. It helps them find a community um, to know that these other people have been through a similar experience. They're not going to think that you're crazy, that you can really be just truly you and vulnerable. And um, and I think like for me, I know it was, I was, I had like nine years where I didn't meet other people who'd been through a loss. And finally, when I met people and I heard them talking, you know, just about certain things about what it's like to, you know, for me, it was like parent after a loss, things like that, that I was like, oh, my thoughts that I thought were so crazy are actually not crazy. They're actually very common. But when you're not talking to other lost parents, you think that you're crazy. So I'm a big advocate for support groups. And um, we, we started doing virtual support groups when, you know, when we all went into quarantine because we couldn't do our retreats anymore. And even though we're not together in person, you know, it's a space that people can just be real. So that's been a blessing I feel for our organization. Um, and I know Postpartum Support International also has a group for pregnancy and infant loss. Uh, I mean, I have groups for a lot of things, but specifically this. Um, I also think that educating parents about self-care and I led a group last night where the topic was self-care and this one mom and she's very educated and we're talking, she's like, I've never heard of self-care. And we're talking about it in the way of this, cultivating mental wellness. It's like, what are you doing to support your mental, emotional and physical health? It is talking about sleeping, eating, um, alone time. It could be, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be things where it can include, like I'm gonna go get a manicure, a pedicure, a massage like things like that, but it's like, I'm going to spend time doing yoga or meditating or taking a walk, or I'm going to, you know, I'm going to take a shower, like that's self-care to me, or just things like that. Um, I think that that can be really important in helping to manage anxiety. And so, uh, you know, yoga and meditation I mentioned can be helpful. And there's a lot of um, I know like Insight Timer has a free app, Calm, Headspace. And I, I know Calm has a free version as well. Like things like that can be just like connecting to your breath. It can be like five minutes. It doesn't have to be a long time. And then nature is very, very healing, right? It's been shown to improve mood in individuals with depression. But being in nature it could be going to the beach. It could be being on a hike just with trees and um, it, could, it could even be going on a walk in your neighborhood and just being outside and hearing birds, stuff like that. Like that can be helpful to your nervous system and just help balance you out and make you understand that, you know, nature is so big and sometimes it can be assuring to know that like, you can give us a little bit of a perspective of like we're not this we're not the center of everything that like that nature is bigger than us. So I did want to share just some links um, to our website. We have a directory for providers and support groups. 
we have a page on pregnancy after loss. There's also another nonprofit specifically devoted to pregnancy after loss mm -hmm. called Pregnancy After Loss Support and their website's up there. Um, we have a providers page on our website you know, for you all to look at to learn more. Um, we also have the entire parent section of the website um, available in Spanish. So we have the website divided into three sections, parents, family and friends, and providers. So if you go to the parents section and there'll be a link and it, it's available in Spanish. We also have brochures available. Um, most brochures are in English and they can, you can look at them through the provider page. Um, and but we do have a few available in Spanish. The, the When Your Baby's Died is in Spanish. Navigating Trauma is in Spanish. And then we have a free parent card that says you're not alone. And um, inside it just has links to like our website. And we have a YouTube channel with parent interviews and some provider interviews, but mostly parent interviews. Um, some of those have subtitles in Spanish. So we have a lot of resources. I would say the website, I'm very proud of it. There's a lot on there, but I think it's it has a lot of valuable information. Um, I didn't put on here the Grieving in the Black Community link, but if you go to the Parents tab at the, like on the menu bar, it's one of the options there. Um, and so I guess back to the parent card, the You're Not Alone um, in English or in Spanish, if you're not, if you're ordering brochures, you can get those for free. But if you're not and you just want them for your clients, you can email me. And I think my email, here's my email, um, which you'll have in the handouts. Um, you can email me and request that, what, you know, what you need, what language you need, and I can send that to you as well. So I will open this up to questions now and um and just know also that i'm here my my email's there just for any questions that you might have if you're watching this or, or listening to this as a recording um, reach out to me i'm happy to help whether i can connect you to other people or answer questions for you um, i just want to be a resource and, and if we can get, you know, if you're working through different hospitals, like, can we get materials into the hospitals and and help help the nurses at the hospitals feel more confident when working with parents going through a loss? So I will stop talking. Um, we have a half an hour for questions, and I'm happy to stay on and talk to anyone who you know who might have questions about anything regarding what, what I talked about. Thank you so much for, for going through this um, and just laying this out in such a uniform way. It's, uh, I think, a really important training that, that a lot of people will benefit from this information. So we, we really appreciate you being here and, and being able to provide this to us. Um, we do have a couple questions, and I want to encourage everybody who is, is on to go ahead and, and type questions in the chat if you have them, if you want to. Um, the, use your voice to ask your questions. You can raise your hand. I don't know if um, because I force muted everybody, I may have to physically unmute you, um, but I'm happy to do that if you want to talk with Kylie too. Um, I'll start with the questions that came up in the chat and then uh, if people have others or um, do end up wanting to talk, then we can go to those too. Um, so the first question was about the um, emotional cushioning that you talked about. And uh, the mm -hmm. question is, can emotional cushioning continue even after the baby is born? The second, yes. this is like the second yeah. after loss. The, yeah. The, yeah, it can. I mean, there can be like a fear of attaching to the baby because you're afraid of losing the baby. Yeah, it can, it can definitely happen afterwards. Um, I mean, I think, I think it would be more like categorize as attachment issues, but um, it's common. And it's also really common for 
there's like a quote on our social media that, you know, we're doing a bunch of quotes this month for pregnancy and infant loss awareness month, but it's like, you know, like the constant fear that your baby's going to die, like your live baby, even though it's living, like constantly like checking on, are they breathing if they get sick, you know? And so it, it, yes, it, it can go, it can move into the period after birth. And that's why I think the importance of number one, um, saying like this could be happening, but is there a mental health provider that can work with them to help them form that attachment to their baby and work on decreasing the anxiety around and fear around losing that child? Great, that's helpful. So I think um, kind of a follow-up question that was asked that will um, connect to this one too is, is how do um, the people on this webinar who are seeing families who um, may have a child that they're they're worried about um, this kind of constant fear of of the child dying even though it is um, alive and healthy and they're maybe that they're seeing that manifest into attachment issues what can they do and what kind of support can they provide to those families um, themselves and then when when do they when should they um, kind of bring somebody else in to help with that too. I mean, to be honest, so I don't know a lot. I mean, I'm, I feel like I can share about my personal experience, but in terms of attachment with babies after birth, I don't know a ton about this. So I, I mean, I would say like in this situation, I mean, a lot of it's going to be helping the mom get the mental health support that she needs. And, um, and, and I think like, I'm not one to, to push medication. Okay. But I will just say that introducing the concept of like, even in pregnancy after loss during the pregnancy, like I would have benefited from medication during that time because my anxiety, like I was paralyzed, you know, and, and understanding that that anxiety, crippling anxiety is worse and could be more harmful to the baby than being on medication. And so I think that if it's, if it's to the point where it is, it is affecting um, the, you know, so the live baby is born affecting the baby's attachment and the mom's mental health is not okay. I think encouraging, you know, helping her set up some mental health support with a mental health provider um, that can also do like, even like mom baby sessions, that that's what they're focusing on is, is creating safety and security. Because if, I mean, as you all know from your trainings about, you know, perinatal mental health, that if there's a lot of anxiety in the mom, that that's going to you know, be a parent and in in impact the baby, then the baby will be more anxious. So I think it's really important that, I mean, honestly, everyone should be, everyone needs support. Um, and so in whatever way that looks, and maybe it's like a mom and baby support group, if that exists, you know, um, or a one-on-one -on -one mental health provider, if that's available. I mean, I'm not sure what resources are available, but everybody needs support after loss and then, and with pregnancy after loss. So that didn't totally answer your question, but I'm just, I'm gonna, I'm gonna encourage finding support for the mom and the family. Thank you. Yeah, I, I think it, I think it did answer. And I think that is helpful for, for everybody. Um, uh, another question that we had was um, wondering if you could share a little bit about the physical changes that occur after loss and how to deal with that. So, and the example here is um, breast milk production and or other physical changes. Yeah. So physically, so it will be similar to if you've had a live baby that you know you just don't have your baby with you. So yes, your milk comes in. Um, your you know, if you've had stitches, whether it's from a vaginal tear or from a C-section, like your body physically has to recover from whatever 
from whether, whether it's a vaginal or a C-section, um, they will be bleeding all that. So breast milk reduction, it can, it, there's the option. So one thing um, some people like to do, and like, I wasn't aware of this. I don't know if I would have done it, but sometimes people will pump and donate their milk because they feel like that's a way that their baby can be giving to other babies. Um, so that is an option. So there's like milk banks that you can research and see. Them. So that is an option. And I think that might be on at the hospital page um, or right, like as, you know, do they want to take a pill to stop their milk coming in? Um, do they, you know, are they gonna just do like cabbage or ice packs or things like that? But, but I think that, you know, having all these physical repercussions of having a baby, but not having a live baby is very triggering, right? Because like they're, they're in pain and they're suffering. They don't have their baby there to show for it. And so it can be a really hard time. And, um, and I would say that in the beginning, and this is not physical, but just like the shock, they're in a lot of shock, but, but checking up on them, like after a couple of weeks, and then who is going to be, I know that you all aren't seeing them pat, you know, if it's the loss, like past two weeks or something, but what supports it can be put in place for following up on these moms? So, but back to the physical part is yes, yes, they're going to go through all the all the physical changes as if they had a live baby. Okay, thank you. Um, another question, I, I you know I think you talked about this quite a, a bit, but I think it is uh, helpful to kind of underscore just so that um, everybody who's here can kind of remember some key takeaways for it. Um, so the, the question is, how do you best support a parent through the days and the months of an impending loss of a child, um, such as this example that they gave is trisomy 18? Mm -hmm. um, so, I mean, I have a few thoughts here. I mean, the first thing is, so if they're carrying, it sounds like they're carrying the baby to term. That's what it sounds like. So I will answer the question as if that's the answer. So, or, so num number one is um, encouraging the parents to really use this time with their baby to make memories with their baby. So you're just saying like this is this is their special time. Um, it is for some people, right? It's like the gift of time where they. They know their baby's not gonna live, but they get this time where their baby's in the womb. And so like, what things do they want to do? Like to parent their baby, to have experiences with their baby. Like some people have done things and made a whole scrapbook of like, oh, we went here and we did this and all, you know. And of course in COVID, you know, not, not as possible, but some people do that. Um, I would encourage them to create a birthing plan of like what do they want this experience to look like when their baby's born again the gift of time allows them to research you know what what can be done in in this situation what do they want to do and i know that there's organizations out there and i probably have them on the website i just don't know them off the top of my head but um websites that talk about like people who are carrying to term and and ideas on you know what what that can look like in terms of making memories that type of stuff. The other thing is palliative care. So not just in terms of looking at a plan for the the labor delivery, but like when their baby's born, what is the what is the plan in the hospital, and what are their choices? Like it doesn't have to be rushed, right? Like they have this time they can plan. Like what choices can they make ahead of time? Do they want to take their baby home? Do they want their baby on life support? Do they, you know, if they're going to, do they, can they, like, what are their wishes for the baby? Can they take their baby outside in the sunshine? If that's the one thing they want to do. Um, what medical intervention in terms of like uh, 
pain medication for the baby, that type of stuff. So if, if the hospital doesn't have like a palliative care nurse, um, what research can be done around, you know, ahead of time around palliative care. So I think that that's, that's an important like term to understand to, to introduce to them that they can start looking into more about. But it's like looking at like the birth plan, the plan after the baby's born, that type of stuff. But but similar things go. It's like, as I said before, it's memory making and parenting your child. Great, thank you. Um, another question that just came in is, um, what do you recommend for supporting fathers or partners um, of the deceased baby? So a lot of times with, you know, fathers or partners, um, their, their outward grief will be delayed because they are taking care of the mom, the, like the birth mother, and or they're seen as the, the bridge between the birth mom and the family and friends. So they're having to stay strong and they're not really, you know, they're kind of in do, doer mode and they're not really letting themselves feel. Plus we live in a society that, you know, if, if emotions or display emotions. And so I think what we can do to support fathers and partners is, is like ask them how they're doing, give them a space to share their feelings, what they're experiencing, um, that's apart from the birth mother, you know, that they have their own space to do that and encouraging them to get, you know, can they go see a mental health provider? Um, and just acknowledging that this is hard for them too. And, and their grief may come out in different ways um, with, you know, I, I think in men, like they want to solve problems and they want to do things. And a lot of times they'll have projects that they'll work on, but sometimes their grief will come out, you know, or the depression part of it will come out as irritability and anger and um, not so much the crying part. And so I think, I think really they just need to be seen where they are. And we have a whole page. Um, so if you go to the parent section, start here, we have a page for fathers that I encourage you to read because it'll have a little bit more information on there um, if you want to look at that. But just, yeah, I mean, acknowledging that they've had a loss too and and what are they going through because they need permission to not have to be strong all the time and and have a space to grieve. Excellent, thank you. Um... We have, I have one more that came up and then um, as I, as you're answering this one, maybe if there's a few more that come in, otherwise um, this is the last one that came up so far. So uh, this is a little more about the support that you, your um, organization provides. So do you do any support groups for moms whose uh, baby has died due to SIDS? Um, we, we don't do a specific support group, but we include them in the, in the pregnancy and infant laws. So what we've been trying to do is we've been trying to do, we just did a miscarriage group, um, which turned out to be actually very like, more like recurrent miscarriages and com complex fertility journeys. And then trying to keep the, the other group to like more stillbirth and infant death. And, and it seems to, um, be okay like combining them has seems to work and that has seemed to work in the past so it's it's going okay okay great thank you so much um there aren't any more questions in the chat so i think um if people have further questions for you or anyone who's watching the recording um has questions your email is nicely displayed here so they can it sounds like feel free to to reach out to you and um definitely 
look through your website to get a lot of great resources and support there too. Yeah, and I can I also add one thing that yeah. I know that um, a lot of the population that you all are working with is lower income, and so we do offer scholarships for our support groups and our retreats, which when we hold retreats. So if I don't want costs to be a barrier, and that there's on the support group page there is a a link that people can apply for a scholarship as well. Great, that's really helpful. Um, I think that's that's nice to to not have that be a barrier. I think that a lot of our families would appreciate that. So. Um, great. Well, thank you so much for being here. This has been um, so informative and, and really helpful. Uh, and I think that um, I speak for everybody when I say that we really appreciated your time and effort and uh, the information that you provided for us today. So thank you so much for being here um, and for everybody who, who attended and were um, here. We appreciate your time too. Um, I'm going to just put the link to the evaluation before I forget. Uh, in the chat. So um, please do take a minute if you are, if you can to fill that out for us. We, we really do appreciate feedback and it helps um, LABBN structure these webinars to be supportive and um, most helpful to you. So please take a second. It's really short um, to fill that out. And I will be following up with everybody um, after the webinar with the slides and the evaluation link again. And then we will post this recording with the slides on the Stronger Families blog, and I'll send out an email with the link to that uh, probably next week sometime. So be on the lookout for that. If you know anybody who uh, would benefit from this, who missed it, or um, would like to watch that recording, please please do use that as a resource. Um, so thank you again, Kylie. We're so grateful to have you here. And um, I know everybody's muted, but I'm sure they're clapping for you. So thank <laughs> you. just uh, yeah. extend a, a big thank, thank you. you. Really appreciate your time. Oh, th thanks for having me and just make, making this topic a priority. I appreciate it. Definitely. Great. Well, thanks, everybody. Okay. Um, have thanks. a great rest of your week. Bye.